So this was a video idea I, I had. Why not go through and read all of the dungeon journals and then talk about the story and how it actually relates to how the game can go forward with what we have been shown. Now, itself, this video will be divided into three main pieces. There will be the reading, where I read through all of the dungeon journals. After that, there will be a short TLDR. Me, I'm going to be explaining what exactly happens in these stories and how and the important parts because admittedly there is a few stories and a bit of love that doesn't truly matter for the entirety of the story these books contain and after this short, short TLDR I will be giving a more personal view of what this game's story might mean I'm going to be talking about things that aren't precisely confirmed, uh, I will be talking about theories and my own opinions on things. The last part, there's no confirmation for most of it, they'll just be guesses. So well, without further ado, let me start with the reading. Now, before I actually start reading the books, there's a few things that I have to explain. I have already read through the books, so the years the books were made in, well, in the story, in the story made in, and the characters who wrote them are written on these. If, you're, if you haven't read the books, then you will not be seeing these names.
broke the silence of the night. It came from the, the right, next to me. Maybe three meters. No, less. My first in instinct was to look for my sword, first and think later. My mind was still blurry from waking up, and my eyes couldn't, could barely see. That scream again, full of terror. My fingers grabbed onto my family hand in my familiar handle. I turned my head towards the sound and raised my sword in front of me, voices echoing from the rest of the room. Arbe, Arbe, Albert was there, frantically trying to grab onto something. He's trying to crawl, or so I thought. I realized that Albert's hand was covered with blood, his fingernails making an atrocious sound on the ground. I could sense a dark mass behind him. A man. Albert! I screamed as I lunged forward, my blade piercing the assassin. As I got closer, light revealed my enemy. Vision of horror. My eyes, barely any skin. No eyes, and barely any skin. The face of death. My heart paced to a crawl. I couldn't move. Its rotten hand grabbed my arm and started to crunch it like a twig. The pain brought me back to reality. I screamed and I tried to free my hand. The creature held on to it, but I kept pulling with everything I had. During the struggle, I felt I fell on my back, the thing lying over me. Something warm dropped from its jaw onto my neck, blood and flesh, Albert or some of him. There was an explosion of light. I closed my eyes, a weight got taken off of me. Moments later, I understood why. A spell landed on the creature, tearing it apart. The fiend flew across the room and landed behind Arbert, Albert. Something crawled in my arm. The hand of the beast was still pressing it with inhumane strength. I managed to grab the thumb and free myself from its grip. The hand landed on the ground and kept moving towards me. Another lightning strike. The hand stopped. Solomon was standing next to me, holding my shoulder. His lips moved, but I couldn't hear him. He was pointing at my arm. I turned my head in the direction of Albert. But he was already dead. The Expedition, Volume 3. A zombie attacked our group during the night, killing one of the soldiers and breaking the arm of another. The two soldiers on shift were standing in front of, front of the only entrance to the room. They swore that nothing came from the corridor. Somehow, that zombie ended up on the opposite side of the crypt that we thoroughly investigated only hours before. What is even more concerning is what it did to those soldiers. It first planted its teeth in the skull of one of the soldiers and took a large bite out of his brain. How Albert survived for as long is a mystery in on of itself. As a precaution, we burned his body. Even after losing limbs, the detached body parts kept operating on their own until the brain was destroyed. Our current theory is that the amal amygdala has to be intact for the zombie to function. Solomon noticed fluids on the same chainmail of the other soldier, where the hand grabbed his arm. It can barely be described without deep analysis. analysis. This liquid could be a clue to those, stand for, to those stand formations or even the cause. The expedition left the room less than an hour after the incident. The group was reaching the end of the second floor when we got confronted by another apparition. The new creature killed three of our men before getting taken down. Now, no doubt, the undead we found was a wither skeleton, the same creature that we dis descri that were described attacking the castle centuries ago, led by Kaiman, the self-proclaimed Wither King. Skeletons, dark as the night, overbearing in nature, with bones akin to onyx, seemingly fragile, but as tough as steel. This one was holding a stone sword, and was strong enough to cut through a man wearing full armor with a single swing. Solomon believes that the expedition must return to, king, to the king's castle at once. We have reason to believe that Kaiman survived and took hold of the catacombs. Our group isn't prepared for a confrontation with the Wither King. General Dan ordered the troops to march on, insisting that we at least explore the third floor before turning back. After all, we still, we still have enough resources for another three days of travel. Expedition Volume 4 Before our encounter with the Wither Skeleton, we heard plenty of odd noises, but during our time on the third floor, just like the first one, there was a deafening silence that caused a great anxiety in us all. After a few hours, the group entered a larger room, probably larger than one, the largest one yet. The room had giant water pipes landing into the large pools, proof that the sewer con had connected with the catacombs. The general said it's time for a break, and the group started to prepare for lunch. Solomon retired reiterated his wish to return to the castle immediately. After a short debate, General Dan agreed to end the expedition. Suddenly, someone yelled that enemies were coming. The sound grew louder and louder, before encompassing us completely. We were surrounded, hundreds of those creatures. How could they be capable of such coordination? A giant spider crawled out from the sewers, zombies appeared from the halls, and a volley of skeletons came from the other came from the other direction. The general immediately called for a rally, and a desperate battle ensued. Somehow, somewhere in the chaos, I saw an opportunity to retreat. I landed a stun spell on a group of enemies near the entrance of the hall and quickly made my escape. A small portion of our group followed. A small pro portion of our group followed me into the passage. 
I do not know what happened to Solomon, the general, and the rest of the militia. I found refuge uh, with a couple of soldiers far away from the battle. Could I get good sense a presence watching us? One of the rescued soldiers was acting odd. He started mumbling to himself, and knowing the catacombs, I was ready for whatever it could be. He started screaming, get out, and clawed at his eyes, but then he stopped. Suddenly, he leaped at his comrade and tried to pierce him with his sword. I used all of my mana to stun him before he could kill. The color in his eyes was gone, as if he was being mind-controlled. Missing a page. The catacombs hides an entire army of incredible stank. Someone has to make it back alive from the expedition. At all co- uh, To explain the symbols, I believe this is supposed to represent blood, as if the writer of this book was killed mid-sentence. The walls. I saw it all. Monsters everywhere and every kind. In an instant, chaos reigned over the room. We were all in battle formation around Dan, pretending to be in control. Everyone was scared for their lives. I fought alongside Dan many times, but this man was a legend. But how foolish can he be? Nobody in the group came even close to his skills. We are, we are all fodder for those foes. We should have tried to escape instead of fighting. The army of undead ran straight at us. Their brains! Aim at their brains! Someone yelled in the back. How can I aim for the brains of a skeleton that doesn't have one? This magic is beyond anything they know of. The sound of swords slicing through, through bloodless corpses, almost like chopping down wood. Zombies are terrifyingly strong, but most of them have no equipment, no technique, just fearlessly running up to their end. I think it was Solomon's spell slowing them all. Their movements seemed sluggish compared to when they entered the room. The mage looked, looked exhausted already, his face con contorted by the concentration. More and more came. It seemed endless. I saw a mage escape with a few soldiers. I wonder what happened to them. And then it happened. The battle was raging when another, another of those big black skeletons entered the room. The obsidian-looking creature ran straight at the general, who noticed it. Dan faced towards it with all his might. The battle veteran was even bigger than the skeleton. He raised his two-handed sword and held it above his head. It was over in an instant. The skeleton was wicked fast. I held my breath, almost as if I was ra the raggy, the racing for impact. Uh, bracing for impact, Dan's massive sword cut through the air incredibly, cut through the air incredibly swiftly, breaking the enemy's sword in half and the skeleton with it. We finally had hope. If anyone could get us out, alive, get us out alive, it was General Dan. After defeating the wither skeleton, the colossal, so the colossal soldier turned towards the rest of the force and released a battle cry. We all responded, coming out of his apparent stop, torpor. Solomon spoke. Something is coming. We need to get out of here. The mage started running towards one of the entrances. Dan, we have to! I looked towards the other entrance and sighed. The nightmare creature entered the room. It looked half human and half with a skeleton, with multiple heads. It levitated over the corpses and, in an awful scream, drew a dark spell right through the general. It was over. Whoever was left from the expedition started running in total disarray. I followed Solomon, who just in who turned just in time to create a magic barrier, protecting us from those demonic spells. I don't know what happened to Solomon. My only concern was with getting as far away as possible. Further in the corridor, I saw a dead soldier, who probably escaped earlier. He was holding a torch and other materials. I would need them. Eventually, hours after I escaped the undead horde, I came upon a room full of empty tombs, and that's where I decided to take shelter for the night. I moved some pillars to block the doorway to prevent anything from sneaking inside. The next morning, everything had gone a lot smoother than expected. Nothing came for me while I was resting, no signs of the expedition either, but I had to stay quiet if I wanted to escape this place alive. I walked through I walked through hours on end. It was impossible to find the entrance of the third floor, so I took a short rest. With an excess of coal on my hands, I decided I would draw markings on the walls to identify where I had been previously. When I left the tomb area earlier, something seemed off. I was almost certain there was a dead end to the left of the hall, but now it's opened up. Did it collapse during the night, or am I crazy? After hours of exploring the ch and charting out the basic map, I returned to my previous resting place by following the coal line drawn upon the floor and walls. However, when I made it back to the room, made it back, the room was no longer there. I walked off to the left side of the corridor. Would my mark still be present? Everything was fine. I noticed the opening was there. It was not a dead end. But as I followed my marking, it was cut off rather abruptly. There was no smear smearing on the ground. It was as if the stain was peeled off. It, complete, it looked completely unnatural. As I walked further, I cast my gaze to the ceiling. There was a black, black streak looking directly on, into my eyes. There was no mistaking it. It was the one I had drawn. But it was now on the ceiling. It was as if 
This place was moving. Oh my lord, how could this even be possible? I have to find a way. I have to. Are these walls alive? Who's doing this? What a terrible joke. Why don't you come out and kill me already? I don't even have food or anything to drink. Get it over with! I don't see. I don't you see? I'm as good as death! As I walk past the walls, I could hear a faint cry. And now, every time I looked at them, they, started, they stared back at me. It's as if they were made from the souls of people. I'll die right here, and maybe I'll join them. All I have left is coal. Yes, all I have. Coal, 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 coal. Next is the book The Eyes. Something notable. From the previous books, we have had different writers. We have had a person called Carola, Pelevia of Miles, Royal Inspector, Random Soldiers. And for the first time, it's a character we all rec recognize. This book was written by Sadan. Let us begin. The Eye. The first time I saw it, it was, on the it was on the first floor. A large floating eye. Nobody else noticed. It was looking straight at me. I didn't tell anyone, but I know what I saw. That thing isn't human, but it didn't seem like an enemy. It appeared again on the second floor, twice. Again, I was the only one who saw it. So, only one who saw. It seemed interested only in me. I can tell when it was watching. There is a strange sense in my head. Strange sensation in my head when, I, when it happened, happens. And I know exactly where to look. At this point, I am fairly certain it was trying to communicate. Nonetheless, it completely vanished after those three encounters. But something else happened during the battle on the third floor. I felt a different sensation. Even before the wither skeleton appeared, I sensed a powerful spirit, spirit long before Solomon noticed. Was he too absorbed by his spell? How could I preserve it faster than a mage, especially one of the one of the caliber of Solomon? Later, I escaped away from the battle, but quickly the original feeling came back. He was watching me again. I pulled my sword and turned towards it. What do you want from me? It came out from the shadows. The Watcher. So much power coming from its eye. I could almost touch it. It was far too strong for me to handle. What? Are you? Why are you? What are you? Why are you following me? Special! A loud voice echoed in my head. It wasn't coming from my consciousne consciousness. I'm special. What do you mean? Your mind. Hard to read. Read my mind? Your name. What? Why do you want to know? Your parents. Who are they? I, I never knew them. Why are you asking this? As it got closer, I could feel its presence intensify. Get out of my head! I'll kill you! My sword was heavy and my knees were weak. The words collapsed. The world collapsed on me as I fell. I could still hear the voice. So, your name is Sadan. I see. This is... Yeah. The aftermath. We completely defeated the humans on the third floor. I could have eradicated them myself if Necron hadn't made an appearance. It shows how important it is for him that we stay hidden for as long as possible. I don't understand. Do they think our army is still weak? Why do they want to hide our presence for so long? We could rule over the humans on this side of the world, instead of rotting down here. We still don't know what caused this group of humans to explore the catacombs, but now it's clear they have they had suspicions of what was inside. No matter what, we have to make a move. I think the plan is to send Storm after the castle if they flee. At least I got confirmation that none of them escaped the catacombs, and a group, and the group only had a few days' worth of resources. The kingdom will understand soon enough what happened. We must strike before they realize. Only two humans are left alive. It seemed like Necron wanted to interrogate the mage. And the other one, I have no idea what the Starker wants with him. Necron is very fond of the eye, so it's free to do whatever it, whatever, free to do whatever eccentricities it wants. Uh, here's an interesting thing. Only two books in the game have don't have a writer. So keep in mind, some, we don't certainly know who wrote this book. But it's clearly from Necron's side. Next up, the, actually, at this point, another thing to note. So far, all of these books have been written on the year 1531 of the Ancient Era. That's the timeline so far. This time is a halfway point, because these books have three main time timelines. No, not timelines. Three ta main time stamps. There's 1531. There's one time that's before 1531, like hundreds of years before, and then there's a time that's more close to us. So, and now, as we're moving on to the Watcher, we are going to go back in time further. So, 
Apprentice. This book happened before all of the other books we have read so far. A gust of wind blew, blew by a man with dark hair and eyes, who was walking away from the academy, academy's building. Necron looked terribly angry. Heated conversations with his professors were common, but after this one, his mind was boiling. How dare they? How dare they tre threaten to expel me from the academy? They should know all too well. I can. I need to know what kind of magic killed my parents all those people 17 years ago, and they still don't change their minds. The worst student, they say, then why don't they help me instead? I can feel my potential growing. I can sense mana all around me. I was born to be a mage. I just need something. Even I can't describe what, I'm, what exactly I'm lacking. It's, it is almost as if I can hear mana and understand it, but I can't speak its language. Yes, that's it. It speaks to me, but I cannot answer. It's answer it back, or not well enough, at least for now. He, walked, he stopped walking as he said that. But what if they expel me from... Expel me? Where will I go? I have nothing. If only, if only they could trust me. I need to read those scrolls. It's vital. I am drawn to them. Every day that goes by makes it even more clear the answers to all my problems. If I could open a single scroll, I could instantly realize, but I already know, maybe I've already known that forbidden magic, what, I, what is locked and labeled as taboo, that is my language. I will reveal it to the world and save them all. The Follower Another vision, like usual, it felt like someone else was controlling it. From there, he could see the castle, but in shambles. Like if centuries had passed, most visions appeared from a different time, where the world is more advanced. Advanced. The vision, the vision took him down the mountain, all the way down. A large portal was standing there on the ground. He had seen it before, in another vision, standing next to it, a group of adventurers he also had seen before, years ago. Uh, Lathorp? Lathorp? Ye yes, Dr. Emmet. He said as he emerged from the dream. Lathorp, I need you to do something for me. And how many times have I told you, stop idling around the breach. You are, you are perturbing. You are perturbing my tools. Sorry, doctor. It's just, I saw the eye again yesterday. The one I talked to you about. Yes, Lathorp, of course. The floating eye. I'm sure that, I'm sure that was very interesting. However, I am serious. This, this experiment is important. You know that. I need, I need you to deliver a letter to my college at the wilderness. And quickly, as it is getting very late, you can spend the night at the inn after delivery. I'll, I'll give you money, enough money for a room and a good meal. When, you're, when you return, don't forget to bring back groceries and some, some chalk. Understood. I will be on my way, Dr. Emmet. Have a good, a good evening, and if you study on the balcony, make sure you keep yourself warm. I shall, Latop. Thank you. Latop went down the ladder, entered the house to grab the letter and the money the doctor left for him, and exited the house in the direction of the zip line. After a few steps, he turned around to look at the house. For some reason, he felt sad. He had lived in this house his entire life. Soon after birth, the calamity made him an orphan, like many others. On that day, a magical breach got created at the top of the mountain, almost invisible to the eye. Soon after, Dr. Emmet started studying the breach to understand what could be, cro what could be across it. Across it but never succeeded at traveling through it. In over 30 years, the breach opened once, and only Lathrop, Lathrop noticed it. In fact, he was expecting it. Lathrop, Lathrop was fortunate enough to be raised by Dr. Emmet after he moved into the house of his late parents. He learned how to read and write, and met many great mages and scientists, all close friends of his adoptive father. For as long as he remembers, the breach showed him visions, sometimes even talked to him. At first it was vague, images and colors. Sometimes in his dreams, he, follow, he learned to live with it, as if it was his own consciousness. While the doctor always acknowledged that these visions were, visions were due to the breach, the depictions by Lathrop always made them seem incoherent, and therefore he couldn't draw a line between hallucinations and reality. Lately, the visions were getting more vivid. The eye appeared again in a few reveries, and with it, more frequent and detailed dreams, unlike the usual aimless ones. Those looked as part of a plan, perhaps instructions for him to follow. After crossing the wooden bridge, Lathrop soon reached the zip line where he began his descent to the castle. The hour was late and he had, he had to hurry, but he could not stop thinking of the eye and its call. The Apprentice, Part 2 The young man was standing on the bed of his window, his eyes lost in the canopy of the forest of the Ar Academy. The movement of the leaves in the moonlight was mesmerizing. So much had happened lately, he couldn't sleep. The, le the hand that he had... 
The hand that he had left on his grimoire started tingling. Sigh. No. <sighs> you don't. You really don't like me, do you? He said as he looked at the old book. He placed it in his drawer. It's not your fault, nor mine. Laying on his bed, his thoughts traveled through to many different places. What was he do, going to do with all this free time? The mage exam was in ten days for the summer solstice. No amount of work could be enough to pass this test. Already one of the oldest students, and only capable of executing very simple spells, the only reason why he was allowed at the academy was that the, day that the dean of the association took him as his own after the tragedy that befell his parents. That man, he tightened his hand and spoke with disdain. He thinks so highly of himself, like he's some sort of father figure to me, but all he does is restrict my actions. He doesn't understand at all. As his eyes were starting to closely shut, he heard a subtle sound, the rustling of paper on the ground near the door. Someone had slipped the paper below it. He could barely see from the distance, but he was starting to get get a strange impression. Rushing to the door, he grabbed the item with both hands. He couldn't believe it. Instinctively, he opened the door, but nobody was there. No footsteps, nothing. His heart was beating abnormally fast. Who and how? The scroll in his hand was bursting with magic but not the kind his teachers were forcing him to learn, something else, something dark. He looked around once more and went back to his room, closing the door and look locking it. Everyone knew he was interested in those forbidden scrolls. That was no secret. Many times in the past he asked the mages of the association to make them public, arguing that they were needed to understand darkness and conquer it. Forbidden scrolls are held in the vault of the Dean, protected by heavy magic spells. Stealing them is unthinkable. How did anyone manage to obtain one of those, and why... Would they give it to him now, of all times? He took a deep breath, trying to calm down. The spell written with, the spell was written with different enchanting symbols. Closing his eyes, eyes, he could still see the signs through this. He could still see the signs through his curtained lips. The feeling was there, the the old one he was waiting so long for. It was a simple spell, but he could learn it. He understood the mechanics and all the nuance. Mana was flow, flowing rapidly through his body. He never felt so good and so powerful. His eternal vocation was finally was finally in his hands. The dark spell could allow him to become invisible to regular magic. Quite useless, he thought, but at least it was something, a confirmation of his affinity with dark magic. Maybe he could at attach it to a talisman or a ring. What could he use it for? Invisibility essentially makes you immune to any kind of vision spell or to enter a weak barrier without notifying its creator. But there was only one barrier he knew, and that was the last place he wanted to be. Next is Apprentice 3. Part 3, I mean. After only a few days, Necron had studied the scroll and learned everything about the spell, but it took him a couple more weeks to plan his next move. He could only think of one application for that spell, and it was almost too perfect. For over a decade after its defeat, the Wither King had been trapped in a cage on the edge of the main island. It was well guarded by ma mages and had a magical barrier, one that would alert the mages if someone had entered. However, Necron could sneak through this barrier without alarming anyone, but only if he used his spell correctly. Necron's goal was to find where the Wither King is trapped inside the barrier and question him. He had spent the last couple of weeks pretending to help the guards with their chores. The mages didn't really watch the gates itself. In fact, they would rather stay a reasonable distance away from it. At sunset, most of the guards went off duty. Necron knew this was his time to act, so he cast his spell in a nearby forest, then proceeded to approach the barrier. Even with many precautions, he was still trembling. He had never experienced such stress in his life. What if something went wrong? As he walked near the east cliff of the island, he quickly entered the magic barrier, and from this point on, everything was a theory. Necron's heart was beating so fast he could hear the palpitations, as he walked inside the barrier, he was prudent in his actions, whether it was checking for magical traps or guards stationed on the inside. But once again, there was nothing. Maybe he was being too careful. Whether the case, he was certainly getting closer. A few hundred steps into the barrier, he felt it. An intense magical power that resonated with him. This foul energy seemed to originate from ahead. And as he approached it, he noticed that the energy was corrupting everything around it. The ground it itself had turned had even turned to variety, varying shades of grey. The grass and earth around him seemed to have lacked colour for a long time. After what, what felt like an eternity, he finally sighed, a large and robust magical cage, 
standing on the very corner of the island. The cage was made of pillars in a circle, channeling a maelstrom of energy inside like a blue tornado. Necrom could barely see through the dense waves of magic, but what he could see was enough to push his sanity to the extreme limits. An imposing creature, at least twice his size, with giant ribs as thick as a man's arm, and three grotesque, dark, shriveled heads, all, di all distinct, yet expressionless. Only the middle one seemed to notice his presence. Negron thought, thought himself to be mentally prepared, but his hands still shook from fear and hesitation. As he walked through the cage, he heard it. A deep, raspy voice spoke from within the swirl of energy. You are using my spell. Necron stopped. He thought the Wither King would be able to speak, but it still came as a surprise. Who are you, and why are you here? The voice asked. Oh, that, that was supposed to be Nick. <laughs> that was supposed to be Wither King's line. Who are you, and why are you here? The voice asked. Why am I here? Necron mumbled, becoming agitated. He wanted to ask many questions, but when he gathered the courage to face his enemy, he couldn't rid himself of, an, uh, of anxiety. My name is Necron. His voice was unsteady, still shaken with fear. You killed my parents 17 years ago. My father was a war hero, and my mother protected me with her life. Necron panted heavily, having cemented his name and burdened, burdened the Wither King. A brief silence ensued. Necron tried to guess what the monster would say, would say back to him, but he couldn't come up with anything. Is that why you're here, Necron? The Wither King answered. No, Necron refuted. You said I was using your spell. What do you mean? Asked ask Necron. Fell magic, or a variant. I created that spell and wrote, wrote the scroll myself. So, so the rumors are true. You were human before, called Kaiman. That is correct. Fell magic, what is it? And why do I have an affinity for it? Have you done something to me? I haven't. Well, at least not intentionally. I never met anyone with an affinity for fell magic. It is quite interesting. The Wither King con continued. While I didn't invent the kind of magic, I was the first human to study it directly from the dragon's heart. But the Academy was against any kind of progress for the dark arts. They have their own agenda. Necron couldn't help but think that this monster in front of him was a lot more human than he thought. Of course, it would just be a facade, but he, but he enjoyed that they had the same opinion regarding the Academy. The difference between him and the Wither King was that of night and day, yet the longer they talked, the more he found a resemblance. Surprisingly, he quickly grew some sort of respect for the creature. The conversation went on for hours. Cayman was willing to teach Necron the basics of dark art, dark magic, but if he wanted to learn any more than that, it would come with a price. He couldn't fully trust the Wither King for now, but his sense of revenge had already totally dissipated, replaced by the excitement of fi having finally found a mighty master, someone who could understand him. Necron knew that allying himself with the Wither King was a cruel joke at best, but at least he could be able to use dark magic, which he had an unnatural affinity towards. With the matter settled, he took his leave. For many me for many weeks in a row, Necron sacrificed sleep to come back, continuing his conversation with Kaiman, oftentimes going deep into the night. He had learned so much already, but was only consumed by his desire to know more. So when the time came for Necron to help Kaiman in return for more teachings, he immediately agreed the request Kaiman wanted to escape, and to that end, he came up with a spell that could destabilize the bar magic barrier. Although the spell would only last for a few seconds, it was by far the most complex and in intense spell Necron ever had to conjure. He positioned himself on the southeast section of the gauge, gauge and began to work it out. At first, there was a small disturbance in the cage, then a ripple in the barrier's energy waves. Necron was perturbed. Surely the magicians, magicians sensed it, but it didn't matter. The spell was almost complete, and then... Tremendous energy poured from the Wither King. The disturbance in the cage became a turmoil, and quickly a hole appeared, growing visible. The barrier in the skies distorted and twisted itself round it. After a flash of light, the barrier was no more. Quickly, Kaiman explained. He left the cage and fired a bolt of, bolt of dark energy to the ground, not only breaking pillars from the cage, but also part of the island itself. Kaiman grabbed Necron, then jumped into the void. But about a hundred meters down, the, the Wither stopped their fall and took the direction of a small opening on the cliff. As soon as they entered, he sealed the passage. What? Just what is? What is? What is this place? Necron exclaimed. The Wither King acute, 
acute sense of death had identified that his gauge was right above a place filled with corpses. The catacombs, Kaiman, Kaiman replied. He had planned his escape to look like an accident, a byproduct of his planning. While hiding in the catacombs, he would have time to heal and prepare his return, while he taught his new apprentice from the shadows. So we've got a bit of a Palpatine and Dark Vader story going on with the Wither King and Necron. Additionally, something to note. This is something I will touch briefly again. But they were talking about a cage and a prison for the Wither King. I believe this prison is... The remains of that prison are on the Hub Island, in the corner near near uh, the Shifty's Bar. I believe that place is what is left of the cage. That was Apprentice 3, and next up we have Follower Part 2. Shortly after depositing the letter, letter Leitro took the road that led to the inn near the bottom of the mountain. He, it was getting very dark, and those roads were not safe at night. Many people went missing in the last couple of years. Ever since the mysterious explosion of the Wither King's cage and its disappearance, strange events started to unfold on the island. While everyone was certain the creature fell in, in the void, many fear that the events are related. As Lathrop ap approached the, the inn, a silhouette entered before him. As he got an impression of deja vu, inside the building the atmosphere was jovial, music was playing, and a few people were apparently having some sort of a contest. Lathrop looked for a table on the side where he, it could be quiet and waited for a waitress. When he looked around, he noticed that, that in the opposite corner from him, the person he saw was sitting alone as well. They were wearing black clothes and had, a dark, and had dark hair. The man had a long cape as well, and there was an odd square-like sh shape underneath it. Obviously, something they wanted to keep hidden from the common eye. It was then that his feeling of deja vu became much more clear. He had seen this scene before, in his vision. Although he could not remember much of it, he knew he was supposed to do something. The waiter, waitress came and let Rob order the meal, but he couldn't stop himself from watching the strange man. Eventually, after another half hour, the man left his table and took the stairs from a, for a room where he would spend the night. Almost as soon as that happened, a man with dark skin joined his table without asking permission. They looked tipsy. Lathrop thought that dro Lathrop thought that staying with them would be trouble, so he got up and left. Hey, the, adv the, advanced, the man advanced towards Lathrop. You look like a nice fellow. It's just that I saw how you were looking at the man who just left. Do you know them? Never seen them around here before, and I'm good with faces. As the man was speaking, he stumbled backward, almost while losing his balance. Uh, looks like I had a few drinks too many. <laughs> the man's words echoed in Lathrop's head. I've seen, I've seen this in my dreams. Suddenly, an entirely out of control word, words flew from his mouth. Yeah, I know him. He's just a merchant, merchant from a from far away who I had some business with before. Lathrop felt a shiver down his spine. Why did I just say that? He thought. He thought. The man looked at him. Hmm. Glad he's not some kind of trouble or something. These days, you never know. We live in a strange time. Sorry for, sorry for bothering you. I'll leave you alone. And he took his cup and went back to sit at his table. Later up, left a few coins on the counter and asked the hostess for a room. A few minutes later, he was in a nice bed, ready to sleep for the night. But he just couldn't shake this feeling that something was about to happen. Murderer. At age 15, years... No, uh, actually... Uh, I'm going to have a mar marker, I'm going to check this. But I believe the follower part 2 was the last of the original books. So, between these two books, there was a large time gap, gap, gap where they, at the end of which they introduced more books. Now, I believe they did some retconning during this time. For example... The Wither King wasn't in Master Mode 7 floor. Well, uh, the game's actual order. There's the dungeon release with these original journals. Then we had some time, and we had Master Mode 7 release with Wither King at the end of that challenge, at the end of that floor. And after the Wither King, quite recently, we had the last journals. I believe that during the time between the original release and having having uh, the Wither King show up in the Master Mode 7 floor, I believe they did some sort of retconning. And I believe they also have done some retconning after with the new books. But without, but let's just continue. 
murderer. At age 15, he, at, at about 15 years age, Livid was already counted among the most gifted members in the Guild of Shadows. A street boy who went from stealing fruits from peddlers' carts to a full-blown member of the guild. When he turned 17, the guild leader gave him his first assassination contract. A merchant paid a, sub a, merchant paid a substantial amount for his competi competitor's disappearance permanently. And Livid, despite his young age, had been chosen for the task. Livid was certainly an experienced thief, but the night he found out he was an even better assassin. His newfound vocation grew, grew in him, quickly becoming what he would call art, and every kill was his new masterpiece. He would often talk about his contracts in gruesome detail with the other members of the guild who hated it, so much so that they tried to remove him from the guild. Unexpe unexpectedly, they were the ones removed. Over the years, he refined his technique, but he could el but he could eliminate his target so easily that he could barely take away any pride in those assassinations. He was now looking for higher profile prey, some he would struggle with. That night, a mantle of heavy fog had rolled down the mountain and shrouding the entire forest as well as the inn nearby. Normally, normal sounds were muffled and everything seemed more subdued that, than usual. For Livid, the night's, condition, night's conditions were ideal. The night he would hunt, and the inn was the perfect place to start. It was rather crowded, and at first glance he couldn't scout any prime victims, so he sat at the table and ordered a drink. An hour later, a mysterious man wearing a large black cape entered the inn and went straight to a corner table, not making eye, con eye contact with anyone. Livid's attention, turn attention turned towards what was under his cape, with which looked like a small chest. Almost immediately after, another man came in and sat down at a table on the op opposite side, then proceeded to study the individual with the black cape for almost an hour, which intrigued Livid, Livid for a moment, even, even more. He had to find out who those people were. From what he could tell, the second man was not a threat, but definitely had a valuable information regarding his potential target. Suddenly, the man with the cape left his table and went upstairs. Livid, Livid walked towards the second man, pretending to have had a few drinks and questioning him about the caped fellow, which turned out to be a merchant from far away. He couldn't ask for a better target. It was settled. Tonight, he would kill. The merchant's room was towards the left side of the inn. The faint glow from a distant steel lamp, street lamp illuminated the open window. With e an economical, move with econom economical movement, Livid climbed the few meters separated hi separating him and the window. A quick pull, and he was sitting on the edge of the window. As he previously analy analyzed, the room was quiet and the merchant was asleep. Livid peered through the peered around, his other senses aiding his search, but no sign of the chest. Unable to locate a safe place to walk without making any sound, Livid pulled out his dagger. He would have to kill the merchant before entering the room. The blade between his fingers, he readied his arm in striking po position. His concentration was halted by a sound coming from the right corner of the room that he had already inspected. One thing he knew, sound does not come from thin air, except when magic is at play. Livid froze in place, holding his breath. The body in the bed was gone. He had been fooled. Before he could do anything, a sharp blade was running through his body. He could feel the steel cutting his heart in half. So, this is it, he thought, and he looked at the man holding the sword, young, but his face was deeply marked, as if his skin was mixed with some sort of grey dust. This was no merchant. He was facing a mage, and a powerful one. The blade was pulled out. It had inscriptions and, mo and motifs on the edge. No blood flowed, and Livid couldn't feel his body anymore. How, how am I still alive? He wailed. Why do you do... What did you do to me? Then he fell on the ground, unconscious. The Follower, Part 3 The misty veil of fog slowly lifted, yet the night still obscured the path ahead. Lathrop followed the mysterious stranger from a distance, his silhouette barely visible in the darkness. The man now seemed to be carrying another, the one from the inn. The sensation of deja vu was growing stronger which, with each step though he could not recall ever having witnessed it before in his visions. The man then ventured on towards the coal caverns, nestled deep within the shadowy woods. Stepping, uh, stepping cautiously into the cave, Lathorpe removed his boots, wary of the sound resonating on the walls. The stranger and his burden were now out of sight, yet the sound of their e progress still echoed through the cavern's corridors. Lathorpe descended one of those corridors, the wood footsteps before him his only guide. Suspicion, suspicion grew as, the, to the, as to their destination. The cold gave was an entrance to the ancient catacombs. 
final resting place of the Cataclysm's casualties. Echoes faded. Lodop waited in silence, ears pricked for any sign of his quarry's passage. Quarry's passage. After a moment, Dean said he resumed his pursuit. At last, he arrived in a large chamber, the catacombs' gateway. The stranger was nowhere in sight. Lodrop was about to inspect the grand wooden door in front of him when a voice shattered the silence from behind him. Why are you? Why are you trailing me? It asked, causing a chill to run down his spine. His fear receded as he is as he turned to face the man from the inn, the large body next to him, and the large body next to him. The sensation of deja vu reached its peak, and the same feeling he had this at the inn overtook him. I must, he muttered. I have seen you in a vision. You speak of visions, Necron said, visibly in three. What is it that you have seen in these visions? I have seen that by following you to your master, I will reach my full extent of... I will reach the full extent of my abilities, Latrop replied. Necron observed Lathrop in silence for a moment, then picked up Livid's unconscious body and slung it over his shoulder. He walked towards the large wooden door, which opened on its own. Come, he said as he stepped into the catacombs. The father. Actually, I point out something again. Actually, I'm incorrect about the father. Following the ritual, Sadan hastened to his chambers. Confusion and anger weren't within him. A few months prior, he had learned that his father yet lived and was a formidable member of the Wither King's army, Storm. Today, he had finally met him in flesh, if it could be called that. After consuming the late Solomon during the ceremony, his father had at last attained his third and final Witherhead, gaining immense power but at the cost of his humanity. Sadan's plot point, he had spent months training, besting every professor in several duels, besting his professor in several duels, and yet his father had not so much as glanced at him, instead choosing to become a creature of nightmares in his pursuit for power. Did he still desire his father's approval? He would never relinquish his humanity to gain it. Of that he was certain. No, his drive was still burning, just different than before. He would surpass even a wither with his own abilities. Sadan swore that, that night, even if his body could never attain the power to rival his father, he would develop a technique so Powerful, he could defeat the strongest of creatures, and one day it would be Storm yearning for his attention. Uh, the Watcher. Necron deemed the man who followed him, Latrop, to be entirely harmless. He then resolved to bring him to his master, intrigued by the potential he had foretold. He would later come to regret that decision deeply. Latrop knew that he was meant to be there, his unshakable belief in the eye and his vision Visions were hard to justify, but something felt so familiar and reli reliable. Nevertheless, visions had never led him to it this far. From the, that point on, he was in the unknown. Encountering the Wither King was a formidable challenge. The mere sight of the creature would drive many sane people to the brink of madness. The three distinct heads regarded him with an apparent sorrow, and then spoke. After a brief conversation, Kaiman led Lathrop to his personal laboratory and stood him before a massive orb, an ancient vision stone of uncertain origin. The wither then commanded him to focus, his, to focus on the center of the glass. The images within the orb swiftly swirled and shifted like a kaleidoscope, offering no clear meaning or pattern to Lathrop as he attempted to decipher them. Then the command, find me, echoed in his mind as he became more deeply en entrapped by the vision before him. Lathrop focused on the reverberating phrase in his mind, find me. As he did so, the images within the vision stone began to slow, began to slow. Patterns appeared, and with incredible focus, Lathrop started to comprehend the vision before him. In this place, where time held no meaning, the images flowed around him, but they moved neither forward nor back. With even more mental effort, Lathrop saw, saw a house, a child, a woman, and the source of that voice, Kaiman. He had found him. As Lathrop emerged from the orb and returned to reality, he was completely trained, but the Wither King deemed the experience a success. Lathrop possessed a natural ability to use the Seeing Stone and could survive the experience. The following months were nothing short of torment for Lathrop, as he was compelled to use the orb every waking hour. His eyes improved dramatically, but he slowly began to lose control of the rest of his body. Kaiman was resolute in unlocking Lathrop's potential, and anything that hindered the goal had to be removed. As Lathrop's limbs became a burden, they were surgically removed, starting with his legs, and then his arms. When Kaiman had finished his experimentation, Lathrop was no longer alive, nor was he dead. His eyes had grown and merged together, while everything else had been lost. Lathrop was no more, and I was now the Watcher.
yes, Lathrop, who Lathrop will become the Watcher, who is the writer of majority of these books. The transformation into the Watcher gave me mastery over the Seeing Stone and immense telepathic ability. No simple-minded being could hide their secrets from me. The pain and suffering I underwent was worth it a hundred times over. With the, with the excitement of a bird learning to fly, I delved into a frenzy of experimentation. Each day brought new discoveries and endless possibilities, but I was still far from understanding that my true role in the grand scheme of things. Through my training, I have come to know every detail of the Wither King's history and the person he used to be, a powerful mage, but also a fragile being, broken too many times. Do I know his story well, I find myself revisiting it time and time again. His memories are too hard to decipher, but they serve as a guide, guide for me in the Vision Stone. At first, the memories were chaotic and disorganary, but eventually I was able to put all the pieces of the puzzle in their proper play, place. From being a top student at the Academy, Kaiman evolved into a renowned researcher in the field of advanced magic. He was extremely diligent in his work, and his passion was boundless. He was always fully absorbed in his research. Despite his immense success, the true starting point of Kaiman's tale lies with her, a farmhand who had been struck by an accident out in the field, and whom he was charged with healing. Her name was Sarah. Her wound was minor, and he only needed to visit her only on three occasions. The first time he was too blind to fully appreciate her charms. He was never given much thought, he never gave much thought to dating or starting a family, but he had very little experience in that regard. Sarah was a radiant beauty, and despite her limited education, her sharp wit and intelligent intelligence shone through in her every word and movement. Her gestures were elegant, her speech poetic and imaginative, consistently surprising Kaiman with their original originality. Sarah also fell deeply in love with Kaiman. He would not fathom how, how such a pure and perfect creature like her could see anything of worth in him. He was but a product of a flawed society, a mere cog in a grotesque machine. They soon joined together and lived a scarfy, carefree life. With Sarah by his side, Kaiman's priorities shifted. He devoted less time to his research and pursuit, pursuit of knowledge. He felt alive and content with Sarah's happiness, taking present, present, precedence over his own. Myla, their firstborn, was a healthy and peaceful child with a determined gaze that hinted at the strong woman she would become. She brought an endless dream of joy to Kaiman's life, but that, that era was soon to end. No one could have predicted the calamity. Yuthar, the millennia-old dragon ruler, launched a surprise attack on the human realm with his entire dragon army. At a time when dragons were so rare that many believed them to be nothing but legend. With the dragon army rapidly approaching, Gaiman and the other mages made their way to the castle. Many kingdoms had already been decimated, and their only hope for survival was a trap of, was a trap of epic proportions that they had spent the day preparing. When Jutar appeared on the horizon, Kaiman realized the true scale of their enemy. The dragon, the dragon was immense, a giant among his kind, and its aura was infused with a magic unlike anything you have ever encountered. Anything he had ever encountered. Only two of Jutar's generals were left, and close to a hundred dragon soldiers were still by his side. As, as predicted, Jutar took a vantage point atop a mountain to survey, to survey the castle and the army of mages behind before unleashed his rap. <clears throat> Let me read that again. Jaitar took a vantage point atop a mountain to survey, survey the castle and the mages of army of mages before. This, this, there should be a dot there. Jaitar took a vantage point atop a mountain to survey the castle and the army of mages before unleashing his wrath. The castle, with its two elite academies of ma magic, was the epitome of magical might in the realm. The trap set by Cayman and his companions was basic yet deadly, and Yaitar had unknowingly fallen for it. As soon as the massive dragon touched down on the Tam mountain, the major trap was unleashed. A surge of magic energy enveloped the dragon emperor, trapping him in place as the crushing force of gravity descended upon him. With, immo with Yaitar immobilized, the battle raged on. Archer stood guard at the, as the mages unleashed their powerful spells upon the dragon emperor, but the dragons fi fiery defenses, but the dragons fiercely defended their ruler, sacrificing their own lives to intercept the incoming spells. Despite the struggling losses, the tide of battle began to turn in the favor of the castle's defenders. 
the powerful barrier protecting the castle held strong, and even the two generals of Jaita's army seemed to be on brink of exhaustion. But soon as hope began to rise, a miracle occurred, defying all known laws of magic, Jaitar, perched atop his mountain, slowly rose to his feet, unfurling his giant wings and standing tall, casting the battlefield into shadow with his immense form. The sunbeam filtered the holes in his wings, revealed the truth of truth to Gaidman. The emperor had been passed on, had passed on, possibly for hours. An unusual magical aura he felt earlier was fell, the magic of the dead. An otherworldly scream erupted from Jaitar's jaws, and then and for a moment time seemed to stand still. Then a blast of dark energy burst from the behemoth, releasing him from the death trap and decimating everything in its wake. As the dragon screen rent the air, time itself did pause, and in that moment the rift at the peak of the mountain, the same rift through which I would communicate with Leitrop in the years to come. But that is a different story for another time. As if the dragon had made a pact with magic itself, he sacrificed his own soul for a brief moment of power and freedom. The blast of dark energy killed thousands upon impact, including his own dragon soldiers. With mighty strokes of, immense, of his immense wings, Jaitar took to the air once more, his soul, soul's sacrifice having won him but a few short, minute, few short minutes of liberation. Shoring to the skies, he circled the realm, leaving no corner unchecked. In his death throes, Jaitar's anger consumed him as he re re recklessly laid waste to all in his path, as if the earth itself was his enemy. Even his own general, Sozon, was not spared, losing his left wing in the blast as he fell to the ground. As Jaitar's pact with death came to a close, he fell to the earth, motionless but consumed by dark flames. The dragon's goal was achieved, leaving the realm in shambles. The familiar terrain had crumbled, shattered into a multitude of isolated islands. Far from the castle's walls, Jaitar landed on one of these newly formed islands in the realm, a tranquil land of, sw of swing, swing herders known as Taika. Taika. Meanwhile, the conflict still raged on, despite only few survivors remaining on both sides. As the Dragon Emperor fell, Kaiman's mind raced to his loved ones. Though his home was not in the vicinity of the castle, he feared for their safety in the aftermath of the blast. He could not return to the fight, return to the fight until he knew they were well. When he reached his home, Kaiman's heart sank as he saw the roof of his had caved in. Fearing the worst, he sprinted the remaining distance and bursted, burst into the house, calling out for his wife in a state of panic, his eyes frantically searching for any sign of them. Unfortunately, Kaiman was too late. His beloved wife and daughter lay dead under the debris, their bodies entwined in a final embrace. The dry tears on Sarah's face, face, face told the story of their last moments. In, in that instant, Kaiman was consumed by grief too great for words. He couldn't accept the truth. There had to be some mistake. His mind was in such turmoil that he didn't even realize the battle had ended when he finally came back to himself. A, a thought, cro thought crossed Gaiman's mind. If magic could allow Chaitar to cheat death, perhaps he could learn to master it himself. With a spell, he preserved the bodies of Sarah and Myla, in the hopes of one day bringing them back to life. In the aftermath of the calamity, there was much to be done, but one of the first tasks was at hand was to deal with the body of Chaitar. The heart was steeped in fell magic and was corrupting everything its, in its proximity. The council decided to re remove Chaitar's heart from him, his fifthly decaying body and agreed to bury it deep within a rocky isle, one with a ver verbatim landscape, but, a slight, but of slight significance, where the potential harm it, could, it might cause could be less con lesser concern. Ooh, this one is long. Kaiman proposed a motion to the council to study the heart of Chaitar. He argued that understanding this power was crucial in order to defend against future threats. The, consul ultimate, the council ultimately denied his request, judging the risk to be too large. Determined to uncover the secrets of fell, fell magic, despite the council's rejection, Kaiman stepped down from his position at the academy and announced his leave. In reality, he traveled to the Hearts Island and established a research facility. Working in secret, Kaiman devoted himself to his research only leaving his hidden laboratory at night and improving the facility during the day. None knew, his pres none knew of his preservation of the bodies of his family, and none suspected his plans. Through his innate ability with magic, 
though his innate ability with magic was strong, came and found the study of fell to be labyrinthic under undertaking. He knew that mastering even a fraction of its power would require years, possibly decades of dedicated study. With, which is, with each passing year, the island became more twisted and corrupted by the fell magic emanating from the dragon's heart. The once lush flora and fauna began to wither and die, giving way to twisted and corrupted creatures of pure fell. The land underneath underwent a metamorphosis, the soil transformed into a petrified white from which whispers echoed. The minerals and stones coalesced, becoming as black as midnight and rose in spikes that reached towards the sky. As the island grew more dangerous, fewer and fewer humans ventured there, giving Kaiman more space to conduct his forbidden research. He was making steady po progress towards mastering the forbidden art. He started by experimenting on small creatures, gradually moving on to reviving small corpses for few hours. As he continued to perfect his technique, he felt incredibly conf confident in his ability. Finally, he felt ready to attempt the ultimate test. Seven years had passed, and Cayman's experiment had taken a toll on his body. He knew he must act quickly to bring his wife and daughter back, for he wanted them to know him as the man they once knew, while he still retained his human form. In the still of night, Cayman brought the bodies of Sarah and Myla to the heart of the island, where the fell magic was at its strongest. And with great care, he cast a spell he had spent years perfecting. Using his own body as a conduit to filter the raw fell, he channeled the dark magic into tears, breathing new life into their lifeless forms. The process was taxing, but he refused to falter, driven by his unfavoring determination. And then, amidst the pulsating glow of the fell, he saw movement, his lord once stirring to life once more, and in that moment, came and knew he had succeeded. His eyes closed in triumph as he ended the spell, his, be his being filled with a newfound serenity. As the fell magic dissipated, Cayman made his way to his wife's side to assist her in standing, but the ritual had left its mark. Her skin now had a strange consistency, and her eyes seemed to have lost some of their vibrancy. Recognizantly placing his arm on her back, helping her sit, he used his other hand to turn her face towards his. She looked at him in silent with an incredulous look. Oh, Sarah, he said as tears began to run down his face. Kaiman recognized that his wife and daughter had not truly returned to him, though their bodies animated under the power of his magic, their minds remained vacant, as if they had lost all their memory of who they once were. With a heavy heart, Gaiman returned, returned his wife and daughter to his laboratory. He devoted himself to their care, but as the days went, as the days passed with no improvement, a sense of hopelessness in lessness. A sense of hopelessness began to cloud his thoughts. Shara and Mile, Sarah and Myla no longer needed sleep or sustenance. They simply stood or sat, wandering aimlessly. To, aimlessly. Though they showed no aggression towards Kaiman, they would occasionally strike out at any insects that pa crossed their path. At time, Sarah would fix her gaze upon him, as if recognizing him. It gave Kaiman renowned hope that their souls still lingered within their bodies, and that he simply had to find a way to restore them. One day, he had witnessed Myla reach her hand to hold her mother's, and his heart swelled with emotion. That moment will forever be etched into Kaiman's mind. It was a small gesture, but this rena renewed sense of hope grew stronger in Kaiman. Overcome with emotion, he stepped forward towards the, the enfold, to enfold both in his embrace, holding them close for several minutes, as a family united, yet forever changed by the cruelty of fate. My love, what happened to us? He whispered. The love he held for Sarah and Mile was boundless, and he knew that he would not rest until they were whole once more. He would spare no expense, no effort, no time. He would do whatever it took, whether it be several years or a hundred. Time marched on, and while Sarah and Myla remained unchanged, Kylman's knowledge of magic grew exponentially. He began to unlock secrets of the soul that no man had ever discovered before. Three years had passed, and Kylman began venture began. Kaiman often ventured forth from his laboratory to further his research. It was during one of these absences that the castle's routine inspection of the island uncovered his hidden laboratory. He returned to find his laboratory in shambles, all his precious scrolls stolen, but the true horror lay in wait for him as he entered the private chamber. The corpses of Sarah and Mila, mutilated beyond recognition, lay before him. The scene was a cruel echo of their first death, the shock of his 
The shock of it sent him spiraling into insanity. He had labored so tirelessly, clinging to the faint hope that he might one day reclaim those cherished moments, and now that hope was utterly lost. But what enraged him the most was the desecration of his beloved by the hands of those who knew not what they did. Short-sighted mortals, making hasty choices, always acting impulsively, cowering in fear before the unknown. They had brutally murdered the ones he held dear, savages, in his darkest hour, as he knelt amidst the remains of his beloved Sarah and Mila, he cursed the barbarous soldiers who had taken their lives. But his life was, no, was now at, the, at an end. Both the ones he loved had, and his own life were beyond salvation. Silently, he gathered the remains of Sarah and Mila and departed from his laboratory, setting his course towards the island's core. As he stood before the heart of Utar, Kaiman summoned the magic to aid him in his quest for vengeance. He cast a spell even at the cost of his own life, in hopes that he would be reunited with his beloved Sara and Myla in the afterlife. As he stood at the threshold of death, death, Kaiman finally understood the true essence of Fel, the power of sacrifice. By giving, up, by giving up his own life, he had unleashed a magic more potent than any he had ever wielded before. As the spell was unleashed, his body rose into the air, engulfed in dark, swirling flames. He felt himself expand, growing stronger as the power of Fel flowed into him. Opening his eyes, he saw something else had joined him in the maelstrom of magic. He saw the remains of his beloved Myla and Sara merge with him in the turmoil. Myla's head fused with his left shoulder, and Sara's with his right. He could not comprehend the meaning of it, as the power flowing into him was too overwhelming. As the spell reached its conclusion, Kaiman stood transformed, his body now completely withered and consumed by the dark flames. No trace of his former self remained, and there once and where there once had been but one head, now there were three. As he surveyed his surroundings, Kaiman recognized the enormity of his new form. Kaiman knew that he now possessed a strength not, that not, could not be measured, and with it the power to seek the justice he so desperately desired. Fueled by his burning anger, Kaiman stood turned to the castle. A decade after the calamity, he would unleash upon them a terror greater than they, than they even ever knew, and if Chaitar was the dragon emperor, then he would be the Wither King. The Orb. My knowledge of the Seeing Stone growing, the Wither King charged me with remaking it, reshaping it to suit his needs. It was a difficult task, but not insurmountable, and I knew precisely what he desired. He was determined to, I was determined to please my master, and so I devoted myself to studying his life before the calamity. I spent months examining every aspect of his past, every detail. By the end of it, I knew the members of his family better than I knew myself. And so, I set about using the orb to create a world identical to the one he had known. I was the architect of this dream, and I built it with care, ensuring that it would be a place where the Wither King could relive his hailcorn days. The end result was a dreamlike realm, where he could lose himself in nostalgia and forget the harsity of reality of the present, a world where the tragedy of the cataclysm never occurred, and the faces of Sarah and Myla still shone with life. With the completion of the new orb, the Wither King spent days lost within the dreamlike realm. Inside he was Kaiman once more. When he emerged, he thanked me, a rare, rare display from him, and a sign that he had regained some of his former self. My task complete, the Wither King then told me he needed me no more, and charged me with remaining loyal to my new master, Necron. Necron's Dilemma Necron was greatly troubled by his recent audience with his master, for since bringing him me to his Bringing me to serve the Wither King, the tyrant had been consumed by a new obsession, and Necron's first worst fears had been realized. During their discourse, Kaiman informed Necron that he, was, he would abandon his designs and trust the catacombs to him, granting him complete autonomy over them. He had relinquished his drive and had at last found solace. Henceforth, Kaiman declared that Necron would, to Necron, he would retreat to a secluded chamber deep within the catacombs, where he would spend eternity in solitude, lost in contemplation of the orb I had created. As he prepared to retreat into his sanctuary, Kaiman had one final request of Necron, to, f to defend the entrance to his sanctuary with his very being, as he would himself work on a power powerful spell to safeguard his slumber. Necron accepted, and Kaiman offered his apologies for his shortcoming as a master, a clear indication that the once terrible Wither King was no longer the same male malevolent ruler, but Necron was soon to understand why. Despite his initial reluctance, Necron never bore me ill will, for we shared a common devotion to our lord and master. 
He could emphasize with the torment I had suffered and acknowledge the role I played in helping Kaiman conquer his demons. In the aftermath, my master's seclusion, Necron I and I had many hours of discourse, and it was through these conversations that he came to understand the true nature of the man he had served. Despite his newfound understanding of Kaiman's motivation, Necron could not deny the dev devastating impact of his master's departure. Not only did it cripple the army they had been build they were building, but it also delayed his ambition for decades, even centuries. Necron was forced to reevaluate his strategy. A larger, more formidable army was now a necessity. He would have to find even stronger soldiers and in instruct them in the ways of necromancy. Even the construction of a factory may be, necess may be necessary. Once this things was clear, one thing was clear. Necron could not allow the truth of the Wither King's departure to be known, for without his protection, the catacombs would be exposed to danger. Until we meet again. As the expedition sent forth from the castle in the late days of 1531 failed to return, whispers began to spread like wildfire. Which, with each, each passing day, the concern grew that the Wither King had survived and fled to the catacombs. The kingdom had known defeat at the hand of Kaiman once before, and they were not prepared to face him him again, let alone an army of tens of thousands of undead risen from the catacombs crypts. Fearing the worst, many began to flee, and when Necron sent his strongest soldier, Storm, to attack the castle with a fraction of his army, months later, the castle was almost, already almost empty. The castle, which had withstood the calamity and the Wither King's attack, now lay in ruin. The prestigious Major's Academy, a beacon of knowledge and power, was also brought to ruin, swallowed by the void, significant signifying the end of an 800-year legacy. In the end, Necron had his revenge, but during his conversation with me, he came to see that his own ambitions were not as honorable as his master's. His quest for revenge was ultimately for his master, not just for himself. Though Necron abs abstained from the battle, his armies emerged victorious, but their leader felt no pride in their triumph. In the wake of his success, he announced, that his commanders, he announced to his commanders that their campaign for domin dominion was far from finished. In reality, Necron found himself re reflecting on the journey thus far, looking back at where he started. He, wa he was amazed by how far he came. He had created not just an army, but a community. The realization made him question his desire for conquest. The catacombs army attacked on the realms proved to be their last. Necron, despite his impulsive nature, turned his attention to fostering and guarding his growing community, and dedicated himself to shielding his master from all harm that may come. As you delve deeper into the pages of these journals, I have left for you, the fate of the catacombs may become clear, but understand, dear re reader, that it is still too early for you to fully grasp the role you play in the grand design of things. Until we meet again, I bid you farewell, the Watcher. So, that is the books as read. Now, I will give you a short synopsis of the story. Basically, there's three time zones, times that we visit during these stories. There's a time way back in the day. There's a time during the grand. There's a time way back in the day before anything we know of. There's a time back in the day when the when the humanity, the kind of humanity. When this world's people were happy and they were powerful, before the castle was ruins and before there was wilderness and lost places, before the end island even. And then we visit a time that is still not present, but it's the earliest time, no, it's the newest story parts that we know of. Now, going in chronological order, there is a long, long ago, a dragon called a dragon emperor and his armies attacked humanity. Back then, the world was way different. There were no islands. There was one collective island, only one, no separate islands. Uh, the dragon king attacked, but humanity's armies eventually prevailed surviving the attacks and winning. During this battle, a mage called Kaeman was instrumental in defeating 
the Dragon King's armies. In a last pitch effort on destroying humanity, the Dragon Emperor gave in to the power of Fel, losing his own life and soul. But with that power and that last ditch effort, he was able to break apart the world, creating islands. But still, the Dragon King died and humanity lived. However, the mage who was instrumental in this battle, Kaiman, lost everything. He lost his daughter and his wife. And so, after this tragic event, he began to study the same magic that had allowed the Dragon Emperor to destroy the world. The magic of Fel, or death. Through the use of this magic, Kaiman would eventually become the Wither King, who is Wither King, and with a new one found hatred against humanity, he attacked the castle again, again losing, losing his battle and getting trapped in a cage. However, during this battle that the Wither King caused, many people lost their lives. Most Importantly, people like Necron lost his entire village and Leithrop lost his family. family. Few y multiple years later, Necron would grow to be an adult. He would eventually learn dark, a bit of dark magic from... We are not exactly sure where, but he got his hands in, on a scroll of dark magic and using that scroll, he was able to find, find and reach the Wither King. Studying under the Wither King for years and becoming powerful as well. And also releasing the, at time, trapped Wither King. Together, they would start to prepare an army in the catacombs. Now, the origin of the catacombs. The catacombs was the final resting place for all those people lost during the Dragon King's rampage. Using these de death in the catacombs, the Wither King and young Necron would begin building an army. But Necron still needed to do things outside the catacombs. He needed to act out as the Wither King's messenger or representative on the above ground and during one of these travels he would stumble on Livid and Leithrop. Livid we know from floor 5 he's a assassin and necromancer he's not too important but it's cool that we know his original story. He, Necron found Livid and Leithrop uh, Leithrop would become uh, would become uh, the Wither King's second, well, not second in command, but would become important part of the Wither King's tasks, because Leithrop would become the Eye, the Watcher. The Watcher has some unique powers such as time traveling, reading minds, and seeing into the past and future. But yes, uh, the Wither King would retire down into the catacombs, left to, fall, left to be, and Necron would attack the kingdom of humanity once again, this time leading to humanity may almost extinct, the great, at least the great kingdom that had lived through first the Dragon King's attack and then Necron, no, the Wither King's first attack would finally fall at the hands of Necron. And then Necron and his armies would retire back into the catacombs and be there for a long, long time. Until we, the players, go down there and kill Necron and the Wither King, ending the tale of the catacombs. 
Some other things to note, however, uh, some other things that happened during this time. We have the story of Sadan and his father Storm. This story is not that important because by the end of the catacombs, both so Storm and both Storm and Sadan are dead. But basically, this gives an exp explanation for why Sadan doesn't himself become a wither. He start wants to find a way to become as powerful as a wither without becoming a wither to sp to basically spite his father. And Storm is basically just a random dude who Necron at some point decided to make his friend, I guess. There's no real explanation for a lot of the different characters in Catacombs, even through these books. Another thing that happened was the expedition. Basically, before, uh, after the disap after Necron saves the Wither King and before Necron attacks the kingdom, there's an expedition. This expedition has a few important people. For example, Sadan is part of the expedition, as well as Solomon, who is not truly important, but he is the second head of Storm. The rest of these characters all eventually die in the catacombs. One of the soldiers, we do, don't know exactly who, but he is probably the one who creates the magic map Mort finds. Again, this at this point I'm going over to the my personal belief. So, I'm not too interested in the exact details of how this story works. The biggest, most important things that I believe have are important are the fact that there's a dragon emperor who somehow from somewhere learned fell magic. We still don't know how exactly the fell magic was originally found. Did the dragon emperor just happen upon it or did someone teach the dragon emperor? As we also don't know what happened to the watcher. He is still somewhere out there. And we might, that might be something that we can explore in the other dungeons once those are released. The last thing that I feel like worth noting. Uh, basically, the Watcher creates a magical orb that shows a different reality. The Watcher is deeply connected with the Rift, because the Rift is basically... The Watcher's special to tool to talk to people in the past. My belief is that the Rift is actually us going into the reality that this orb creates. And by and because of that, we will might be able to meet Kaeman, the man that would become the Wither King in this Rift. Which is quite kinda of exciting. So that's the main points of this, these dungeon journals. They, they tell the story of the dungeons and introduce us to a few new things. Such as the dragons, which I believe are going to be the next big bad of this story. One thing that, they, that these novels do miss out on explaining is the Void Gloom. The Void Gloom Seraph is described as Necro... No, as the Wither King's second hand. However, we don't really see that happening in these books. Secondly, and well, lastly, few interesting details. We know that Livid is actually older than Sadan. Livid is maybe the third oldest 
third oldest person in the catacomb, well, fourth oldest behind the Wither King, Necron, and Lathrop. That's just kind of surprising. I didn't expect Livid to be one of the oldest characters. But indeed, he is one of the oldest. And lastly, there is a uh, one of Wither King's daughters. Wait, not one. Wither King's daughter was called Mile. And in the second book, we have the study by Plavier of Miles. I believe this is a continuity, like this is just a coincidence in the story. It just happens that there are two Miles. These are not the same character. But I, like the meta reason for why this is, is that I believe one of the developers who were a part of creating these stories created the Pavilion of Miles. Miles is someone important to this developer. Uh, they created the name here and then they used it again because they forget, forgot about this. It's not important after all. But yeah, that's the catacombs. Well, the catacombs journals. The most important takeaway from this is that there's a dragon emperor and probably more stuff to come with dragons. We're probably gonna fight the dragon queen that is described by the NPC in the end. That's going to be probably the next like new addition that we're gonna get to the story. Secondarily, the rift is in all likelihood going to be the magical orb that the Wither King used to create a different reality. So we're probably going to meet Cayman in the Rift and he's going to be with a character called Sarah and Miles. Yeah, so that's this video. Hope you enjoyed me wasting two hours reading books and yeah, bye.